So one day, good old Charlie Brown and Linus and Lucy were lying on the ground looking up at the clouds in the sky. And Lucy says, aren't the clouds beautiful? They look like big balls of cotton. I, I could just be here all day and watch them drift by. And then Lucy says, and if you use your imagination, you can see lots of things in the clouds. Linus, she says, what do you see in the clouds? And Linus says, well, those clouds up there, they, they look like a map of, of British Honduras on the Caribbean. And, and the clouds look a little like the profile of Thomas Aikens, the famous painter and sculptor. And, and that group of clouds over there gives me the impression of the stoning of Stephen. And, and I see the Apostle Paul standing there nearby. And Lucy says, whoa, that's, that's impressive, right? Very good. And what do you see in the clouds, Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown says, well, I was going to say I see a ducky and a horsey, <laughs> but I've changed my mind. <laughs> you know, while it's all fun, fun and games to subjectively, you know, see different shapes in the sky when we look at the clouds, however, the stakes are very high when it comes to how we envision God. Who God is and what God is like is not some subjective thing that's open to our interpretation or imagination. God has revealed Himself to us, and we can objectively know God. But unfortunately, rather than looking for the truth in Scripture, many people prefer to envision God a God of their own imagination. And so when some people use their imagination and think of God, they think of God like Santa Claus. Yes, Santa Claus who doesn't care if you're naughty or nice. He, he winks at sin and giggles at iniquity. He is too loving and kind to allow anyone to go to hell. That's, that's the Santa Claus God. Whereas other people, when they use their imaginations, they think of God as being like a kindly old grandfather. And I like being a kindly old grandfather, right? But as a kindly old grandfather, God accepts all His children just the way they are. And He never bothers to change them. He's, he gives them everything they want and never expects anything in return. And a God who, who, who honors all religions and sees that one way to Him is just as good as another. And a God who's so accepting of everyone and everything that everybody's going to be led in heaven someday. See, those visions of God are all well and good, except for one thing. That's not how God has revealed Himself to us in Scripture. If I were to ask you when you think about God... What is it that you imagine? What would you say? Would you say, I imagine a God of love? Or I imagine a God of grace or a God of mercy and forgiveness? Or, or I imagine a God of hope or I imagine a God of strength who helps me in my weakness or a God of the second chance when I fail? And if you've been listening to my preaching very long, you know that I believe in a God who has all those attributes. A God of love, and a God of grace, and a God of forgiveness, and a God of second and third and fourth chances. But if we're not careful, those attributes of God can morph into a God who's just there to make life easier for us. Who doesn't really care about sin or disobedience. And if we allow ourselves to think that way about God, we've forgotten one of the most important characteristics of God. The holiness of God. See, God is holy. And in many ways, the holiness of God is His central attribute. Holiness is what makes God, God. Holiness is the only attribute of God that's mentioned in triplicate. So there are two times when the Bible tells us that God is holy, 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 like we just sang about in this great hymn of old. Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, 
in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. If God says something about his character one time, that's enough, right? We take it as it is, right? But if God says something about his character twice, then that's emphasis. But when God says something about his character in triplicate three times, then that means it's of supreme importance. See, repetition like that in the Hebrew language performs the work of a highlighter in our modern usage or the exclamation point. No other attributes of God receive that kind of triplicate emphasis. Nowhere in the Bible do you see love, 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 or grace, 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 or justice, justice, justice. The only attribute of God that receives that kind of triplicate attention is holy, holy, holy. Now, what do we usually think when we think of the word holy? Maybe we think of something that's sacred or something that's religious or spiritual, something consecrated or set apart. Maybe we think of the Holy Bible, right? Or you are standing on holy ground. Or sometimes we talk, call the communion, holy communion, right? Or maybe you think of it as just an expression of surprise. Holy smokes! Or holy cow! Or holy mackerel! Or holy shamoli, you know? But what does holy mean when it's applied to God? What does God mean when he says he is holy, holy, holy? Well, the words holy sanctified and consecrated, and even the word saint, they all come from the same root words in Hebrew and Greek. And the word holy has two meanings, and both of them apply to God. Number one, God is utterly pure and undefiled. That's holy. And number two, God is different and unique and special and set apart. So God is utterly pure and truly different and unique. He is holy and wholly different. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and H-O-L-E-Y. Both of those. God is wholly different. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and verse 2, Hannah prayed, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. I like Psalm 96 and verse 9 as well. Worship the Lord in splendor, in the splendor of His holiness. But in Isaiah 40 and 25, God says of Himself, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Isaiah 5 and verse 16, God says of Himself, but the Lord of armies is exalted by His justice, and the Holy God demonstrates His holiness through His righteousness. And so through these verses and so many others, we realize God is utterly unique and different from everyone and everything else. He's in a category all by Himself. God's purity and righteousness are the standard for all righteousness and goodness. God is truly holy. He is perfectly righteous. He is altogether good. And His holiness puts Him at odds with everything that is unholy or sinful. And if you and I, if we want to be holy as God is holy, which is something that God commands of us, right? Then we had better hate sin as much as God does. We must never excuse it or dabble in it or coddle it. So my aim for today's sermon is to try to help us capture a vision of the holiness of God so that we must realize to take God's holiness as serious as God takes His holiness and to strive to be holy like our God is holy. And to try to help us see and revere God for His holiness, I want us to look at several times in history when God emphasized His holiness and emphasized our need to be humbled by that holiness. 
So let's look at some of these instances. And let's start with an experience that Moses had with the holiness of God in Exodus 3. And you remember that Moses was born during that time when the Egyptian Pharaoh was having all of the Jewish boys killed at birth. But Moses' parents protected him. They hid him as long as they could, and, and then they put him in that little boat basket, right? And they floated him in the Nile close to where Pharaoh's own daughter took her daily baths, hoping that she would find him, hoping that she would have compassion on this child. And she did. And she raised Moses as her own. And so for the first 40 years of Moses' life, he was raised as the adoptive son of Pharaoh's daughter. But around age 40, Moses tired of seeing the suffering of his people, the Jewish people. And one day he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the Hebrew slaves. And Moses decided to take matters in his own hands. And he, he killed the Egyptian and hit him. But when this was discovered, Moses was forced to flee Egypt. And, and he went into that Sinai desert. And there he spent the next 40 years of his life tending the sheep of his father-in-law. One day while Moses was tending the sheep near Mount Sinai, he met God for the first time. He saw a bush that was burning and not being consumed. And fascinated by the sight, Moses walked closer to investigate. And that's when God spoke. The Bible says God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. He answered, do not come closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy God continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So Moses was on holy ground because God was present. And Moses learned that when a person is in the presence of God, then that which is dirty or that which is ordinary needs to be removed and set aside because of the holiness of God. Now, you know God had a big assignment for Moses. But the first thing God wanted Moses to understand about God is that He is holy and that He must be revered and respected. And it looks like Moses got the point, right? He hid his face from God. God is holy, and he must be honored as holy. The next lesson in the holiness of God is found in the book of Leviticus, just a little bit after this, right? The time when God instituted the new priesthood under the newly delivered old covenant. Leviticus Chapters 8 and 9 tell us about this. Tell us how Aaron and his sons were appointed to be these mediators, these priests of this new covenant. New then, old now, right? This covenant between man and God, and God and man. They were given special robes, and they were to offer special sacrifices. And on that inaugural day, when the priesthood was established, Aaron placed the offerings on the altar and he lifted his hands toward the people and he blessed them. And after Aaron came down from the altar, he and Moses entered into the tent of meeting where they met with God. And when they came out of the tent of meeting, this is what happened. The Bible says when they came out, they blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted, and they fell face down. How exciting, right? How terrifying at the same time. The very next verse in the Bible, which is the first verse of the next chapter. And as you know, chapters are our own making, right? Just to help us find stuff in the Bible. We don't know how much time took place, if any, between what just took place with fire coming to consume the, the sacrifice that Aaron had placed on there and what takes place. The very next verse of chapter 10 says that Nadab and Abihu 
took their own fire pans and presented unauthorized fire to the Lord. And how did God respond? Verse 2, fire came from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. I'm sure everyone was shocked and horrified, especially Aaron. That was his sons. The priesthood is just getting started. The Bible says in verse 3, Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has spoken. I will demonstrate my holiness to those who are near me, and I will reveal my glory before all the people. And Aaron was silent. What could he say? Why did this happen? What was God trying to teach them and us? You know, we've often used this story to emphasize that we need to do the right things in the right way in our worship before the Lord. And that's an important for us, that's important for us to learn and to carry out. But I think there's a greater lesson in this than that. And that is that God is a God who must be taken seriously. A God who must be honored as holy. And God is honored as holy when we follow His commands. Later in Numbers chapter 20, it was Moses who made the mistake of not taking God's holiness seriousness and seriously enough. It was another one of those times when Moses and the Israelites were wandering in the desert and guess what they couldn't find? Water. You don't find a lot of water in the desert, right? They've been in this situation before. But rather than going to the Lord, the people came against Moses and Aaron. And they complained to them and against them. Moses and Aaron left the people, fell face down before the Lord at the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared and gave Moses specific instructions. Moses and Aaron were instructed to take the staff of the Lord and assemble the community of the Israelites. Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. And then water would come from the rock. Unfortunately, Moses didn't follow God's instructions. The Bible says in verse 9, So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And Moses said... Listen, you rebels. (laughs) Must we bring water out of this rock for you? And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. And abundant water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. What a happy ending to the story, right? Everybody's happy, right? God's not happy. And the Bible says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Moses' disobedience was an affront to God's holiness and required punishment. And so Moses and Aaron weren't allowed to enter Canaan, the land of promise, along with the Israelites. And their long lives came quickly to an end. God is a holy God. He must be honored as holy. The next lesson in God's holiness came later when David became the second king of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we learn about David's first official act as king of the whole whole nation. David gathered 30,000 chosen men of Israel to go with him to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. They placed the ark on a brand new ox cart. You know your Bible, that's not the way the ark was supposed to be transported, right? 
There were holes or, or rings on the side of the ark that the poles were to go through, and the Levites were the only ones to carry the ark according to God's instructions. But David was a pragmatist. And in his mind, he thought, as long as you're trying to honor the Lord, you can do it any way you want, right? Wrong. So while the ark moved along on the cart, David and all those with him were celebrating with dancing and music. It was a joyful time. The ark of the Lord was coming to Jerusalem. But then the Bible tells us the ox that was pulling the cart stumbled and the ark began to tip. And Usa did the very thing that you or I would have done, right? we got to steady the ark. We can't have it fall off the cart. And he reached out and touched the ark. And the Bible says, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence. And he died there next to the ark of God. And the Bible says David was angry at the Lord. He should have been angry at himself. He should have known better. He should have known to always inquire of the Lord, to ask how God wanted his things to be done. What was God trying to say by striking Uzzah dead? God was saying, I'm a holy God. And I must be honored as holy. And a person honors me as holy by respecting and obeying me and my commands. Are we getting an understanding of this? About the holiness of God? Our next lesson in God's holiness came even later in the history of Israel. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 6. And the background of what's happening here in Isaiah 6 is found in 2 Kings 15. It's the 52nd year of the reign of King Uzziah. For 52 years, God has blessed the nation of Israel because Uzziah was a good king. But he was dead. And who would lead Judah now? And all of Judah was focused on the Assyrians who were moving into their land, gobbling up city after city. Jerusalem was in chaos. The people were frightened and trembled. But in the same year that Uzziah died, the Bible says Isaiah was called by God to be a prophet. But before Isaiah began his ministry, God wanted to show Isaiah something. And so here in Isaiah 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high and lo on a lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. And seraphim were standing above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And the foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Whoa! is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. So Isaiah is one of those rare people that get a glimpse of the true glory of God. He got to see into that heavenly throne room and see the one seated on the throne and to see the things surrounding God there in that heavenly place. He saw the flaming creatures called seraphim with their six wings and he heard them shout to each other, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of His glory. And when Isaiah saw the holiness of God, he immediately felt the unholiness of himself, right? This is the right response that all of us should have when we catch a glimpse of understanding of God's glory. He's holy, and we are not. And Isaiah was afraid this was his undoing. This was his end. But you know the story. God commands the angel to bring a coal from the altar to, to purify and consecrate Isaiah for his mission. 
We've already noted the significance of the triplicate, holy, holy, holy. But let me also note this phrase, the whole earth is full of His glory, is found 194 times in the Old Testament. You think God wants us to pay attention to that? 35 times just in the book of Isaiah. The whole earth is full of God's glory. David Wells, in his book entitled No Place for Truth, makes an important observation. We need to see the glory of God. It's very important that we understand the holiness of God, but I'm afraid we've lost touch with that. And Wells writes this, The loss of the traditional vision of God as holy is now manifested everywhere in the evangelical world. It is the key to understanding why sin and grace have become such empty terms. What depth of meaning can these terms have except in relation to the holiness of God? Divorced from the holiness of God, sin is merely self-defeating behavior or a breach of etiquette. Divorced from the holiness of God, grace is merely empty rhetoric, pious window dressing for the modern technique by which sinners work out their own salvation. Divorced from the holiness of God, our gospel becomes indistinguishable from any of a host of alternative self-help doctrines. Divorced from the holiness of God, our public morality is reduced to little more than an accumulation of trade-offs between competing private interests. Divorced from the holiness of God, our worship becomes mere entertainment. The holiness of God is the very cornerstone of the Christian faith. It's the foundation of reality. Sin is defiance of God's holiness. And the cross is the outworking in victory of God's holiness. And faith is the recognition of God's holiness. Knowing that God is holy is therefore the key to knowing life as it truly is and knowing Christ as He truly is and knowing why He came and knowing how life will end. Unquote. Powerful words. God is holy. And it's something we must never forget. Always remember. It gives us insight into everything. Lest you think the holiness of God is just an Old Testament thing. Let me share one more time when the holiness of God showed up. And this one's in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 4, we learn about a man named Barnabas. Remember him, the son of encouragement. He sold a field and brought all the money to the apostles to be used for benevolence. And Ananias and Sapphira, in chapter 5, they saw what Barnabas did. They saw the kudos that he got. And they wanted the kudos, but they didn't want to give all the money from the sale of their land. And so, they only gave half. But they said it was the whole. Now keep in mind, they had the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do with their land and their money, right? And once the land was sold, they didn't have to give any of it to the Lord or to the church. They didn't have to. But one thing they had to do, and that is tell the truth about what they were doing. So when Ananias took only half of the money and he gave it to the apostles saying that this was all the money he got for selling the property, Peter said to him, This is Acts 5.3. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. And when he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead. And great fear came on all those who heard. And the Bible continues. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, she said. 
for that price. Then Peter said to her, Why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in and found her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard about these things. What's the moral of the story? Obviously, this is a lesson in lying, right? Lying is wrong, right? Yes, lying is wrong. But there's a bigger lesson in this story. Haven't we all lied at times? And we didn't drop dead immediately, did we? We need to keep in mind that this was the early days of the church. And God was making clear to the church, I am a holy God, and I must be honored as holy. And anyone who messes with a holy God is not going to win. Now let me conclude by asking us, how seriously are we taking the holiness of God? Have you taken God seriously this week? Did you spend time this week with your holy God in the Word? in prayer, in spiritual work and sacrifice, in living it out daily? How seriously have you taken the holiness of God in our worship this morning? Have you been focusing on that? We have prayed to a holy God this morning, right? A God who is the creator of everything in the world. We've sung praises to a God who fills the heavenly temple with just the hem of His garment. we communed with the God who is holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of His glory. Did you prepare to come to worship a God like that this morning? Or did you come without thought, haphazardly, coming in late? How seriously do we take our God and our worship of God. Can we honestly believe that we can worship God without giving real thought to His holiness and His majesty? We're on holy ground. We're in the presence of a holy God. There are angels all around, as we sang a minute ago. So I'm preaching this lesson this morning so that you, so that I, can have a better sense of the glory of God. That we can see Him as He really is. Yes, a loving God. Yes, a merciful God. But also, a holy God who we must take very seriously. What makes His love a pure love? What makes His grace a righteous grace? What makes His forgiveness everything we need? It is the fact that He is a holy God, the God of God. And there is no one like him. Now maybe somebody here this morning feels the need to repent. And you and I can repent right where we are, between us and God, right? Or maybe someone else has a sense that they need to come and repent before others. To make a renewed commitment to their holy God. To have us pray for them. To receive God's forgiveness. Maybe someone else need, feels the need to confess their faith in Christ for the first time. And to repent and turn to God. And to be united with Christ in baptism. To receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whose job in us is to make us more holy. 